Okay, I'm ready. I want to talk again about the structure and the themes of today's movie Ripley's Game before we watch the last series of scenes, which will not bring us to the conclusion, so I will also mention how the movie ends. We're trying to understand to what extent the main character in this film is Machiavellian and whether we find evidence of a Machiavellian mindset for this character, the character of Tom Ripley. So clearly Tom Ripley is the center of the story, the protagonist of the story. But the story really starts with, after the premise, right? In the premise we find Tom Ripley three years earlier in Germany trying to sell forged art. Then we find him set up in Italy with a talented musician, wife, living in a beautiful Palladian villa near Vicenza, enjoying a good life full of luxury and apparently good taste. But the twist from which the story really takes its beginning, its start, is when a neighbor and somebody who's also working for Tom Ripley as a picture framer, Jonathan Trevanni, makes a joke, insults Tom Ripley during his birthday party, not knowing that Ripley has entered, just entered the house and is at the door of the kitchen where Jonathan Trevanni is serving coffee to his friends. And Jonathan basically says, tells his friend, oh, Tom Ripley has a lot of money, plenty of money, but no taste at all. So Tom Ripley is insulted by this because something at his core is touched by this kind of remark, right? Tom Ripley, as a character in this film, is very much in tune with the aesthetic side of his lifestyle. And he decides to create a game, that is the game of the title, that will be played against Jonathan Trevanni and targets Jonathan Trevanni. The other key element in the setup of this game, so we know early on that Tom Ripley wants his revenge. We understand what the revenge will be about. He doesn't want to kill, maim, or torture Jonathan Trevanni. That would be too easy, even for a psychopath, a sociopath such as Tom Ripley. It's a subtler kind of game. He wants to show Jonathan Trevanni and the people around him, such as his wife, his family, that Jonathan is not superior to Tom, is not better than Tom, that Jonathan lives a tame life, the life of a conformist, the life of a weak player in society, but he himself can be corrupted. He's not as strong as he thinks he is. Keep this in mind because we'll return then to whether or not this goal is achieved by Tom Ripley at the end of the movie. So once this is the general, the goal of the game is identified, the details of the game are actually prompted by the return of an accomplice from the past. This very crass, rough American by the name of Reeves, who was doing, involved in criminal activities with Tom in Germany years earlier, and Reeves come back from the past. This we saw last Friday, because he needs to have Tom go back to Berlin and help him assassinate 
a member of the Eastern Mafia that is uh, damaging the business stability of Reeves in Germany. By this time, Reeves has a restaurant, a couple of nightclubs. It's a small fish altogether and therefore can be targeted by the Eastern Mafia. It needs someone who's outside, an outsider, so that he will not be easily connected to the killing of his rival uh, in, in the Eastern Mafia organization. Of course, Tom Ripley wants to get rid of Reeves. And he uh, takes care of both his targets the former accomplice and his new target, Jonathan Trevanni, by setting up a plan, by sending Reeves to Jonathan Trevanni, because Jonathan Trevanni suffers from myeloid leukemia, a chronic condition that can be fatal. In the book, the lethality of the disease of this condition is underplayed, and in fact, there is an attempt to mount a scheme to convince Jonathan that he is in fact dying and have him participate as a result in this murder. In the film, it is just assumed that Jonathan Trevanni doesn't have uh, too long to live and is not particularly rich, so he can be sensitive to the proposal that Reeves following the suggestion of Tom Ripley, offers him at the Cipriani Cafe and Restaurant at the end of the segment that we watched last Friday, and that's where we will resume. Reeves offer $50,000 to Jonathan to go to Berlin and kill a member of the Mafia, of course. There is some uh, finessing of the proposal. They tell him, well, you come to Berlin to see this great doctor, the specialist, and then you'll decide whether you also want to uh, kill this man and come back home with uh, $50,000, which Jonathan, Jonathan eventually will agree to do it. While Jonathan is in Berlin, Tom Ripley is working on his wife, pretending not to know anything and sharing the perplexity of Jonathan's wife about Jonathan's behavior. It is important, it confirms that Tom Ripley's target is Jonathan's world. He wants to take from him everything of value. The love of his wife, the respect of his family, and his self-respect. Because at some point, the idea is that Jonathan will realize that he has lost everything, including his own identity, right? That is what Tom has in mind. It won't go exactly as planned. So Jonathan does the first killing. However, Reeves continue to get at him and says, you have to uh, do another killing for me. I'll give you another 50,000, but it's also at this point, it becomes harder and harder for Jonathan to get out of the game because Jonathan is kind of the weakest link in this kind of game. So Jonathan goes to Germany again. The second killing has to take place on a train and we'll see the, the, the initial setup uh, today for that uh, killing. It's not easy and it's much messier uh, than the first murder which was quick and, and relatively easy for, for Jonathan. This time, physical uh, violence, direct contact is required. But exactly when you might think that Jonathan could fail and uh, be caught by the bodyguards of this mafioso, Tom Ripley shows up on the train to help him. Because again, we know for the third time that 
the goal of Ripley's game is not simply to have Jonathan suffer some kind of painful death, is to lose all the respect he has, even for himself. So Tom needs Jonathan to complete even this uh, very involved uh, se second series of murders, because in the end more than one person will have to be eliminated, to plunge him even more deeply into this debasement, right? So, the second set of killings takes place. However, the Eastern Mafia this time comes after uh, Tom Ripley a second time. Uh, sorry, comes against Reeves a second time. They try to get him, they cannot. However, they follow him. Reeves goes to Tom Ripley a second time and This time, Ripley has to face the attack of the mafiosi and eliminate these mafiosi. And this time, Jonathan comes to the rescue. This we have the first turn in a different direction. This is where the goal set by Tom Ripley goes awry. It's not, uh, he, he, Tom Ripley just expects to have to face the attack of several members of, of the crew sent by the Eastern Mafia to Vicenza to uh, kill Ripley and eliminate uh, Reeves, uh, and is perfectly willing to, to do this, right? Uh, Jonathan, unrequested, comes to the villa saying, I'll be with you, I'll help you. And, and this is when you see that, the first time you see that Tom Ripley's game is failing because Jonathan hasn't really lost touch with his core nature. He's basically a good man. He's basically a nice guy to a fault, but he's a nice guy. And even in this case, he acts as a nice guy, meaning that his own self-interest would be to stay out, not to risk his life. And instead, he feels obliged as a friendly gesture, which is something that Tom Ripley cannot understand, to come and be at the side of Tom Ripley waiting for the killers. Of course, his support and help is, is, is completely irrelevant. There isn't really much that he can do against other professional killers. Only Tom has the experience. Yet, at the very end of the movie, after the major attack by this crew of uh, goons from, uh, sent from Berlin has been uh, defeated, Tom Ripley realizes that another criminal from the same crew has parked his car near the house of Jonathan Trevani. At this point, Jonathan has been sent home with the assumption that everything is, is over. And Tom goes himself to the house. And there is another confrontation. The criminal has taken Jonathan's wife. Tom is at the door. Jonathan is in this room. And Tom tries to shoot the killer. The killer takes a shot at Tom, but Jonathan gets in the middle and is shot. And Jonathan saves Tom Ripley's life. So we see now that the goal that Tom Ripley set for himself to ruin Jonathan psychologically, and was basically kind of a mind game, has failed. Because Jonathan has made the ultimate sacrifice for him. In the book, is not completely clear that Jonathan does this intentionally, voluntarily. And the book ends with Tom thinking about Jonathan's gesture and wondering whether in fact it was a, a random event or the result of uh, Jonathan's will to 
show that he's better than Tom by uh, saving another man's life, even a man whose life uh, is, is not really that important or should be less important than the life of his wife, the future of his family, etc. So this was the game and of course you can uh, uh, schematize this way and the assumption for the movie is that the context in which the, movie, the, the game is played with these players involved interacting with each other is a completely closed game. There is hardly any intervention by the police or external society. It's like the game is just among them, which is something that, of course, films do a lot of by reducing the scope of the story and just following the characters without pretending that external society would never be involved, whether it be the neighbors hearing the shots or the police in Italy, the police in Germany, etc. So it's clearly a fictional kind of closure of enclosure for the game, but we'll, we'll take it at literary value. There are three quotes that you will hear that are worth of notice. Uh, Ripley defines himself an improviser. And, and we know that, we know that even from the first movie, the talented Mr. Ripley. Although in the first movie, the character was an improviser in the sense that he was impulsive most of the time. That his criminal actions and especially his murders were never premeditated and planned, which is true in real life. Most murders are not premeditated and planned, and planned right? Even though you get the opposite impression by looking at, at murderers in, in films. What you don't see in the first movie we watched, the one by Minghella, the talented Miss Ripley, and you see more in here, is that the improv improvisational skills of Tom Ripley are also demonstrated by the fact that he's intuitive, he can think of it on his feet. He doesn't plan ahead, but he can come up with a plan very quickly. And we see both aspects, right? Because at the beginning of the film, if you remember last Friday, we saw Ripley kill the bodyguard of the collector who was supposed to purchase the forged art. And, and that was just an impulsive kind of killing. But we also see now the other side, quick thinking. There is another passage that is interesting when he says, when Tom says to Tom, says to Jonathan, don't worry, don't, don't worry, because of course, Jonathan is worried, as, as, as an average innocent man would, would do, about being caught, right, and the consequences. And, and, and uh, Tom says, don't worry, nobody's watching. So, and of course, nobody's watching doesn't mean that really nobody's watching, but that nobody's paying attention, which is very true, and which is why uh, a lot of crimes, including murders, go unsolved. So it's not exactly a Machiavellian position. Machiavelli would say you have to be ready in case anyone is watching, right? Otherwise, uh, this would not be a true Machiavellian plan. And the basic solution is that the Machiavellian leader is so high in the game that they always have some kind of remedy or recourse against the intervention of the police or other overseen authority. Basically, Machiavellian's leader is above those levels, is above the judicial system. And, and therefore, the price to be paid if someone is watching is political, is not jail, which makes a lot of difference. Basically, by setting the game in Machiavelli's The Prince at the highest level, Machiavelli is saying the prince controls the rule, whereas Tom cannot change the rules, or Jonathan. The rules of society, which are, for example, you can get arrested, you can get interrogated, you end up in jail, you, you are tried, etc., etc. Those rules cannot be touched at all by Tom or Jonathan or anyone involved, whereas the Machiavellian leader is above those rules. 
and that's why you can achieve the highest form of control or you can find elements uh, of, of better alignment with the Machiavellian ideology when you consider modern day politicians or modern day mafia dons or the heads of, of mafia organization because they themselves are not completely above the rules but we know that mafia organizations and their leaders can get to judges and you find reference to that politicians and you find references to that in the godfather part one that we saw but you find them in real life for example god he was tried several times for stupid crimes violent crimes and not convicted because of course they could manipulate the judge the jury the eyewitnesses so Gotti could say I don't have to worry about people watching Tom can just say chances are no one is watching really right it's not true that no one is watching but most people are not paying attention to what goes on around them and as a result as a corollary of this um, Tom says I never worry about the things I cannot control, which sounds like the prayer of AA, right? Uh, given the strength to accept the things that I cannot change, etc. It's, it's kind of a, a trivial line, but it's true, right? So there are only some things he can control at his level of the social game, and whether he worries or not about things he cannot control, the police, the judicial system, etc., doesn't make a difference, okay? So we can take that, uh, that statement um, for what it really means. Now, keep in mind that ultimately the uh, motive, the, the reason why Tom is doing this is just for his own pleasure, right? He's trying to treat Jonathan as a toy, as a pet for, the, for this game. The goal is to take everything from Jonathan, not in a material sense, but in a psychological sense, to take away his respect, and in that regard, he fails. The usual questions, is the game and the goal of the game necessary? No, it isn't, right? Because ultimately, everything is driven by pleasure and a sociopathic, psychopathic kind of fun in, in Tom. However, even Machiavelli will tell you in The Prince that leaders don't necessarily need to worry about minor vices, about minor shortcomings, about things that they shouldn't be doing, but because of their inclinations and personality they will do if they're in control of the game. So even Machiavelli is aware of the fact that you cannot hypothesize the existence of a perfect leader, that any leader will have some vices, and he found plenty of examples in classical literature. It is one of the staples, one of the most striking qualities of uh, Roman his, ancient Roman historiography, that a lot of leaders between the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Empire are portrayed as people with limitations. People who uh, had extraordinary qualities and extraordinarily low points in their private lives. Extraordinarily shortcomings, uh, extraordinary shortcomings, uh, and, and yet they were successful. Okay, so the Romans uh, had, had a very valued realism a lot. You see that even in sculptures and paintings where, where you see all the wrinkles, all the defects. There is no attempt to idealize, the, idealize and, and, and filter out the imperfections in a face. And the same is true for the biographies of their major leaders. That is to say their private shortcomings, even the, the, the smallest uh, uh, sins that were reported didn't take away from, from their realization. So, it is necessary? No, it isn't, right? Is the uh, goal of the various games and the overall goal predictable to an extent? 
It is, of course, it's ironic that ultimately he fails, but he's very much in control of everything else. Is the game repeatable? Well, Jonathan is not Machiavellian, right? He's involved in crime, but he would never be able to repeat anything that he did because he relied too much on the support of Reeves first, Tom later. Reeves is not Machiavellian again. He relies a lot on Tom's support or even Jonathan support. The only character who's somewhat Machiavellian is Tom in himself because we know about Tom that you could take everything from him at this point. His wealth, his wife, um, his, his hiding place in Vicenza and he can start again. Uh, create another series of scams, uh, get wealthy again, get powerful again, right? He has the skills to play a Machiavellian game, whereas the other characters, including especially Jonathan and Reeves, rely too much on fortuna, on fortune, rely too much on what the circumstances offer them in terms of opportunity. And the balance between skills and fortune virtue and fortune is different from these two characters. These two characters, their lives are dominated by fortune. In the case of Tom, Tom is not dominated by circumstances. Okay, so I've said everything that I wanted to say. I will just add, as usual, uh, for your participation grade, if you want to post on the Google Docs file, you shared with me some notes or write some notes on a piece of paper and leave it with your name at the end. Um, I will appreciate it because there won't be any chances for a discussion. And again, we resume from the point where Reeves is meeting with Jonathan to discuss the offer that Reeves has for Jonathan, go to Berlin, kill a member of the Eastern Mafia, and go home with $50,000 that he can leave to his family after he dies. <laughs> and this, of course, is to also compare the general attitude of Jonathan, who's the only one who never insists, he's very light, very respectful, with the insistent or even rough crass behavior in social interactions displayed by Reeves, and also by, by Tom, who's the other one who goes through this pattern of insistence, right? At the beginning, in the kitchen, when he says, meaning, 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 while having sex with his wife, saying, I'll tell you if you turn over, I'll tell you if you turn over, which is something you never see Jonathan engage in, because essentially this is not his game.